As Guyana sits on the economic and political crossroads, we speak to the nation's opinion leaders and decision makers to get their views on the challenges the country faces and the path it must take to achieve national development. Welcome to Nation Watch. Now here is your host Mervyn Williams, former member of the Guyana Parliament. Hello everyone and welcome to Nation Watch for today, 10th September 2023. We are going to have a very, very interesting conversation. So call your friends, call your neighbors, tell them Nation Watch is on watch for the nation today, Sunday, 10th September 2023. Before I introduce my guest, there's a little issue I'd like to bring to the public's attention. Hururu. Hururu is an indigenous village on the Burbese River. Hururu is again in crisis. Hururu has at its disposal 24 million Guyana dollars, and that's for the development of the village. There's a Tushau there who is a very, very powerful gentleman. He traveled to Georgetown, withdrew in excess of $3.5 million, went back to the village, called the contractor, paid him $3.5 million, he says, to develop a play field. The villagers, on the other hand, believe that there's a massive accountability deficit right there. And this is only a sample of the accountability defects in that village. So the villagers yesterday stopped trucks from entering the village um, and they put a halt to whatever developmental plan the Tushau had in his head. Now this gentleman reportedly wields so much power that he can say to the village councillors and his deputy Tushau, you don't make decisions here. He believes that as show, he can override the village decisions, ignore the general village meeting um, decisions. The villagers complain that a relative of his was doing some construction a couple of days ago on a particular plot of land that the village council determined would be kept for extension um, of the village community um, center. And so the deputy to show and a number of councillors met, discussed the issue and took a letter to this individual to cease and desist from, from doing anything on the land and pointing out that it was a long-standing council decision that this is a reserve for council expansion. The villagers contend that the two show went there, spoke with his relative and told his relative to continue doing whatever was being done and chided the deputy to show and councillors publicly for what they did and telling them in no uncertain terms that he is the to show he is a justice of the peace and he is the authority that makes all decisions in the village now i want to introduce my guest mr gabriel lal the popularly known as GHK Lal, a prolific writer and opinion shaper, a gentleman who has recently um, been in the media from both sides, from his end of the pen or the keyboard, and the target of some people who believes that he is not supposed to be doing what he is doing. Mr. Lal, welcome to Nation Watch. This is your second visit. And third, yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good to share with you, my, my fellow Guyanese. Mr. Lal, I described a situation a moment ago, which seems to be a smaller version of what's on play on the national stage, where there's one particular individual who possesses so much power, countermands even the president publicly in some instances. And 
we we have these smaller um, positions of authority manned by some persons, like this Tushau, for example, who seem to believe that this is the way to go. What's happening in our society? What's happening in our society, Marvin, is that we've got too many sawdust Caesars and too many potty Hitlers. You can, you can do it both ways, potty and potty Hitlers, who have decided, have taken, who are so filled, who are so overwhelmed with pride, with hubris, that they don't hear anything other than the sound of their own voices, and they feel the power surges coming out of them in terms of what they can do, who can't tell them anything, and therefore they must run a mock, do as they please. I think you use the word small. It is a microcosm of what is occurring across our society because there's this drive. There's this drive towards control, domination. And so you have it at the village level, way, way out in the name that you call Uluru, and I hope I have that right, and in other regions way, way out that I've never been to. And we hear about this and, and we can imagine that you what you have are these little emperors. I'm in charge. Come to me. Nothing can happen without me. And that is what is happening. And I think we, we unfortunately, unfortunately, we have seen some of that at the very top of our society in terms that this one upmanship, this one way street, this top down, this this is the way I've said it, and this is what it's going to be. And by the way, you can't do nothing but it. Well, precisely, that is what is happening in Hururu. It's um, the replication of what's happening on the national, larger political um, mm -hmm. stage. It's rather unfortunate, but Hururu is but an example of what is happening in other indigenous villages. Mm -hmm. And the Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Amerindian Peoples Affairs, it's styled now, um, seem, seems to be extremely um, oblivious to what's happening, seems to not have the courage to address the issue. Mm -hmm. And we have a fair idea why. Mm -hmm. But we are discussing today the pervasive poverty in oil-rich Guyana. And these management deficits, like we've just highlighted in Hururu, a little village, contribute in a large way to this pervasive poverty. What flows from, from, from those who are charged with um, responsibilities for management seem to block the resources from reaching the persons who should be the direct beneficiaries of those resources. And already we know that more than 40% of whatever goes into public infrastructure development gets lost somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And again, um, I ask, what is wrong with our management in this country that allows, if you look if you look at the at the, um, the national picture, we're talking about 1.8 billion US dollars um, of a national budget that could be going someplace where it's not supposed to go. You know, I think you should be the writer, Marvin, because you're using words like lost, money's being lost, money's the money's don't be of that magnitude. <laughs> don't be lost. <laughs> Come on. Let's I, mean, get... I can't find it. I can't go into the pockets that it's in. So, <laughs> Look, seriously, seriously. And you use the word management. Uh, what's going on here? I, I think the mentality, if the mentality of public service, let's hold off on poverty for a minute and pervasive, pervasiveness. If the mentality of me going into public service is to exercise authority and to show who's boss and to get rich and to benefit my families and friends 
my circle. Again, we, we go back now to what happens at the central stage and at the higher stage, which is about cabals. So when you talk about 40% being lost, right, in, in, in monies, this is what we're having here at this middle and lower level across the board. So whether it's in Barbies or in Aishalton or in Maruka or wherever. Now, the theme or the topic for today is perversive, pervasive poverty in an oil-rich country. The oil-rich countries are given. Fellow Guyanese, the oil-rich countries are given. Nobody's scribbling about that in terms of, we got oil and we ain't got oil and we got so much and we ain't got so much. No, 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 we have oil. Everybody is, we can stipulate to that. Pervasive, simple definition across the board widespread. Pervasive is widespread. It's almost in an epidemic proportions. Poverty. You know, poverty is a little boy and is growing up as in the high school. I used to think you can't buy food. But poverty is more than that. Mervyn, as we know now, as, as mature, not necessarily older men, but poverty is, is uh, education, health care, roads, infrastructure, cost of living, being able to manage with all those things. How much education did we get? So pervasive poverty in an oil-rich country. So again, we go to the example that you have taken for us, which I think was very, very timely and very relevant. And if this is happening in this little pocket, involving what, $24 million, you said? Yes. $24 million. So if you put $240 million in that gentleman's hand, or you put another 24 over there and 50 and 48 over there. Sooner or later that adds up. And when you talk about 40% of monies being <laughs> lost, uh, you know, I, I remember a US Congressman, I'm trying to remember his name. He said, if you talk a billion here and a billion there, soon enough you're talking about serious money. Serious money we're talking about. And by the way, that is the great old United States of America. We are talking about Guyana. We are talking about Guyana here and poverty. We are oil rich and we have all these things in our favor, Morgan. We have all these things going in our favor, 11 billion barrels of oil. We have all kinds of investor interests coming here. We have a vice president who says, I will not uh, be a party to spooking investors. What does he know about spooking investors? I can tell him about that, but that's not the purpose of here. It's a two-way street. But the monies that are coming into this country that has budgeted 781, I think, 0 0.2 or 0 0.9, 0 0.9. 0 0.9 mm -hmm. How much has gone in, aside from infrastructure, to people empowerment of people? Poverty. We, dis we defined poverty. Uh-uh. Pervasive widespread, almost an ep uh, epidemic proportion. Poverty, we said, is all these things. If the money is not reaching the people down at the levels where they need it the most, then we've got more than poverty. We've got a terrible state of poverty. We've got what the World Bank and UNICEF and ECLAC and those guys call multi-dimensional poverty. Now, that was a new one to me when I first heard about it, because you think about poverty in these narrow into these narrow streams. And when you add all these other things about people who are lacking in different things, how can this be in a society where we are talking about money, money, money? And we're not talking in millions anymore. We're talking about billions. We are talking about billions upon billions most of the time. 781.9 billion in the budget. I'd be interested to know how much was earmarked. We know about $40,000 for this. We know about pensioners getting some money. We know, we know about, about uh, $25,000 and all that stuff from before and this year. And we are saying, why is it in this oil rich country? We have to wait. We have to wait on a handout. In addition to the budgeted money or adjacent to it, Last year, we had 607 million U.S. dollars 
We're talking American dollars here now. So that's $125 billion taken out. This year, the approval at the parliamentary level is for, I think, a billion US dollars to be withdrawn. So that we were talking before, at the, at the beginning, mm -hmm. before the program started, where does that kind of money go? And please, don't tell me it's lost. It's too much to be lost. Where does, how is not reaching into Ururu and Maruka and, and, and Sophia and Caneville and, and the other places? The World Bank in its study that says 48% of our people uh, are living on $5.50 US a day, says that the poverty is mainly in the rural interior. Yep. And the poverty is to a lesser extent, but it's very much there in the coastal, the coastal areas. So you're looking at this belt, and then we come into the city, we come into the so-called urban areas, mm -hmm. and we have the agricolas and the squatting areas uh, in, in here, in Georgetown, and in Albaistan, and, and, and Tiger Bay, or whatever they call them now. And so you've got not little pockets, you've got huge pockets of poverty, and it just should not be in a country with the kind of money coming in and earmarked. Well, let's talk about the kind of money that's coming in. Budget 2023, $781.9 billion. Still not sufficient for the People's Progressive Party administration mm -hmm. to manage the country's economy with. So they went back not once or twice, but three times. Mm -hmm. this, this is really um, taking advantage of the contingencies fund mm -hmm. because here is a government with 782 billion dollars at a record a record and 40 percent more than the previous year mm -hmm. raiding the contingency fund mm -hmm. three times when there was no emergency no unforeseen circumstances no immediate need for spending there was no natural disaster no flood hurricane or anything of that nature and so they went back to $61 billion, and the $61 billion, interestingly, was for ministries like finance ministry, the, minister, the, the, the minister's office, and so on. They just couldn't find that money in $782 billion. And then they went again for another $4.7 billion, an interesting situation with um, the Amerindian Development Fund, which I have issues with, major issues, but we can talk about that another time. Um, and again, they went for the third one. $26.5 billion. 92 total. Yeah, so, so we're now at a national budget of $874 billion Guyana dollars. So the original budget has been upped by 11.8%. Mm -hmm. So the question now is, if 782 billion wasn't enough, but still we cannot see any relief in the area of cost of living, mm -hmm. we cannot see any relief in the area of the nurses earning a better um, emolument. We can't see teachers earning better. We can't see greater comfort for students going to school. We can't get from people who manage homes a sense that they're more comfortable now than they were last year, or that they're more comfortable now than they were in 2019. Means that something is fundamentally wrong even though the money has grown, and, and uh, to use your term, this is really, this is real money. Where is it? Why does it not meet? Why does it not meet the ordinary Guyanese citizen who is a public servant, who, who um, has a small business? Why is it not getting there to benefit these people? Well, I, there's no return there. There's no return in terms of when you have a contract where the emphasis has been on infrastructure. So when you have a, the, the whole contract, Shibang, about who should get it, 
who's favored to get it. And that whole circle of rewards and kickbacks and, and whatever else goes on there, you put money into the, into the tax system so people can take home more. There's nothing coming there for you as a, as, a, as, a, as a politician or as a political agent. You you put money in roads, etc. There's always a piece that could be sliced off. As much as 42%. As much as 42%, sir. And you can't lose that kind of money. So you talk about management. So I, I'm tempted to use your word and say, is this management, is this mismanagement, is it deliberate management of a deliberate kind that they don't teach in the textbooks? You know, that we, we don't really talk about corruption in textbooks. You think that it's this way, management by consensus and, and, and so on and so forth. But the fact is, this is too much money. Mervyn, this is too much money. Fellow Guyanese, this is too much money for the third time for you and your neighbor not to get a piece, not to feel the effects. Okay, we're now an oil rich country. We're the fastest of this and the biggest of that and all of that per head and, head and so on and so forth. How different are we now that we are the richest people in the world versus when we were not? When we were hippic. We're, okay. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we were anemic yeah. economically. When, the gold where I was present for three years was the linchpin of the economy. You, you had nothing else. Gold was subsidizing a lot of things. Yeah. And if anything, with gold got frozen, where well, we had hell to face. So I didn't want that part there to be on my head. So you just moved to heaven and uh, mountains to, to get going. Now, we have had these monies budgeted and supplementary budgets and withdrawal from the from the oil fund almost 200 billion dollars in the last couple of years and when we asked the the honorable minister of finance dr singh a bright guy no no no, no 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 i'm sorry sorry to interrupt you uh, when last i checked he wasn't the minister of finance he's the minister with responsibility in the office of the president for something precisely <laughs> right precisely my, my understanding therefore is that Inferred in that long title uh -huh. is that the president is the minister of finance. All right. But Dr. Ashni Singh uh, is not the minister of finance per se. Precisely. <laughs> okay. So what do we call him? That's Dr. Singh. No, we call him the minister within the minute, the office of the president with responsibility for finance. Yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry I started this one up. <laughs> All right, listen to this. Dr. Singh, I'm going to start it. I'm going to limit myself to that sort. I ain't going for it. No. I, I, I can't manage it, right? He said, national development priorities for all the money we've taken out of the aisle. And what is national development priorities? People, the people have got to be the national development priority. Yeah. But why are the people not treated as such? And why are they not benefiting as they ought to? This is the, this is the big question. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I listen, let's be frank here. If they put that money on a structured basis into the payment system, mm -hmm. not this cash and out business, which is another load of something, I, right? I'm wondering what percentage of that get lost, <laughs> gets lost too, <laughs> right? So you, you, to get the money to the people into a, a, a long-term plan, a structure, which should have been in place by now in a structured through the government payment mechanism, people will feel the difference. Incidentally, before I came here, I'm surprised you didn't mention it. There's talk coming out of government offices, as high as the president, that there's, uh, we're doing a financial analysis of the numbers, uh, something like that, with a view to raising the minimum wage. Yes, right? and the tax threshold. And the tax threshold. So let me see. I think the private sector is what sixty thousand. That's the last number. About, about that, and, yeah. the, and the public sector is eighty-one thousand, eighty thousand. Mm. So, my guess is, let's say we're going to go from sixty to seventy-five for the private sector, and eighty to a hundred. Generously, let's hold the tax for a minute. I don't think that's going to make much of a difference. 
I don't think it's going to go there either. Well, I'm being generous. So overly generous. Overly I'd generous. Say. Good. So the tax threshold, you're at uh, 85, 85,000 a month. Yes, somewhere along those lines. So I'm being generous again. We'll make it a round number, a hundred thousand dollars. We're gonna make it a hundred thousand. So, the, but I think the leader of the opposition and some other people, including Christopher Ram and, my, and I, have said it can't be sixty thousand and seventy five thousand and eighty. And we, we got to be talking something like a hundred and forty, fifty, sixty thousand. And now we start saying that the poverty, the poverty squeeze that the people there where they can't live. Forget about living in the, like a, a rich person mm. where they can't live comfortably. This thing, that's when we'll be able to, to manage. Of course, I'm hearing the echoes, the screams already about inflation and too much money chasing, too much goods and all. I'm saying, listen, we've tried the other way and our people are struggling. We need to come up with a program whereby this money gets down to the people, whether it's more take home pay from their from their paycheck, where there's more. I'm 67 years of age. I was. Well, I'm, all I'm going to say is the vice president. I'm not going to call any titles for him because he seems to have all of them. Came out and said seven thousand dollars, and some people jumped up. And I said, hold on, hold on, buddy. It's for two years. It's not for one year. It's for 24 and 25. Some smartness, some wisdom came up there. Said so we're going to put two years together, and you see, it's seven thousand is a bit, as opposed to telling you you can get three. But that Are practice you... started since 1992, <laughs> right? When uh, 1993, in fact, when they awarded a, I believe it was a 10 percent wage increase, um, from whatever the wage increase percentage was, but it was effective from the first of July, mm -hmm. which pretty much means it was half. Right. of what was announced. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's that, but, but, but let me go back to this fundamental question that we, we are hitting it, but not, I think, as sufficiently I would like. Why the money in getting to the people? Why the people are not feeling a little ease, a considerable amount of ease, relief in terms of cost of living, in terms of the other elements that go in to poverty relief, you know, education we're getting some of that and health care and transportation and electricity and, and and water bills and and so on and so forth i tell people this and i say this on, on every show i go if i had to live in this country and depend on what was coming i'd be dead i will be starting i'll be dead because how do people live in this country marvin we ask we ask the same question over and over. Why is the money not getting to the people? In budget 2023, the nation was assured that the sum of $5 billion has been set aside to deal with the issue of the adverse effect of cost of living. I checked with parliamentary representatives for the AP and UAFC, and they have assured me that not a cent of that $5 billion has yet been touched by the government. So we're in September, mm -hmm. $5 billion was voted early up in the year to, in some way or the other, kind of ease the shock of the spiraling costs of living. But the People's Progressive Party government, in its wisdom, has decided, or maybe maybe um, one person has decided, this money is not going to be touched until I say so. It comes back to Huru. It comes back to the Huru thing. So this five billion has not been touched. Is there a genuine um, care on the part of the government that can be evident? In a circumstance such as this, where this five billion is sitting there, people are hungry, people are scrambling to make ends meet. And the five billion sits there, the nurses don't get an increase, the teachers don't get an increment, um, the police officers don't get an increase. And then there's the slogan, because we care. This is annoying, isn't it? It's a contradiction in 
not terms a contradiction of reality because here it is you've called all you've called that a list of people a list of groups of people and they're significant in terms that there are thousands of of people in each group teachers and public servants and nurses policemen just to name a few the community is far away from here and we've got five billion dollars we went back three times for supplementary money we got this five billion which excuse me folks but i have to call it what it is a slush fund it's not been touched yet but somewhere along the line we i mean when are we going to we're going to throw we're going to throw out like santa claus uh, Precisely a Christmas setup in the a uh, retroactive November. small increase yeah. to January one. And you see how 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 nice we are to you, how how caring we are, yeah. how how benevolent we are. I, look, that's not governance. That's not government. It's not governance. It's not management. That sounds like some kind of politicking. You gotta help me there. It appears as though we're playing with the minds of citizens yeah. who are sitting on the edge, really. Mm -hmm. Now the leader of the opposition. Um, has said more than once, in fact, several times, that there has to be a minimum livable wage. And that that minimum livable wage, once identified through careful study, an urgent careful study at that, should be that level of income that should not be taxed. Mm -hmm. So if you determine that the minimum livable wage is $150,000 per month, for public servant, for example, it means that what the leader of the opposition is advocating for is a tax threshold, a tax threshold of $150,000 mm -hmm. per month mm -hmm. and a minimum wage of $150,000 per month. Mm -hmm. So that minimum wage earners will not be touched mm -hmm. or affected in any way mm -hmm. by income tax, PAYE. How valuable is such a suggestion? And if it is at all valuable in your considered view, why is the government not paying attention to these kinds of proposals? I am of two minds here. Let's be clear. Our citizens, those at the base of the pyramid, not at the bottom of the ladder, the base of the pyramid is pretty long and it's pretty thick. Yeah. They need help. They're crying out for relief. You just got to read Starbuck News, cost of living Monday, every Monday morning. Yeah. Their number 40 is going to be on this Monday. It, it's been pretty, it's a horror show. $150,000 is a good number. It's a solid number. I am for it. Here's the qualifier. Here's the qualifier. I'm not going to get two ways here, so I'm going to have to make a, I'm going to have to come clean. $150,000 minimum wage, non-taxable. It's solid. It's got some teeth and some traction. I'm concerned about inflation, but I can hear that inflation, people still got to eat and they got to spend and they got to travel and they got to pay the light bill and they have to pay the water bill. Very, very valid points. And that these are, these are monthly expenses that are not going away. I'm trying to make this in a common sense form. Very, very simple. Nothing fancy about demand and supply and all of that business. $150,000, it is not $100,000. The minimum wage is, let, let, let me go backwards. The minimum wage is not $100,000, and we know it's not going to get there. Like we just talked with this right. one. It's not hundred twenty. dollars So you notice I'm creeping up. It's not hundred and thirty. dollars It's hundred and fifty. dollars but what I'm afraid of, then we're going to be chasing inflation and talking about inflation taming and so on and so forth. And by the way, those numbers that are coming out, of the Bank of Guyana, at least for food inflation. I don't know where they get those from. They have got some pretty bright guys there, but I, I, I got my, I've got my doubts about that. Those inflation numbers, food inflation especially. Mr. Winston Jordan, and 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 on this program several several months ago, made the point that food inflation is at a frightening level. Yes, sir. At that time, I don't remember the number, but I know it was well over 20%. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Jordan has managed this economy mm -hmm. with a measure of success. Mm -hmm. And so he has done these studies and he knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's another issue. The apparent um, 
the apparent cosmetics that are being applied to numbers. Yeah. Numbers are, are in scarce supply. Numbers are not available. And when they do come out, they are not, in my book, reliable. But let's go back to that, that number, $150,000. It's, it's the number. I've heard numbers higher than that from accountants and, and other people who are pretty versed in this thing. And it's not partisan numbers like they are out to get the mm -hmm. People's Progressive Party. I've heard numbers that are bigger than 150,000, but I think 150,000. Inflation considerations duly absorbed and so on and so forth, I think 140, 150,000. And, and, and tax free. Tax free, a reasonable number. Yeah. What do you think about a tax base, a tax rate with, with, with uh, what's it called again? Free pay? Yeah. Free pay for marriage and free pay for children and free pay for elderly. What I, do you think about I, that? We had that before. There were um, deductions for dependents. No, do you think it would help? I think it's more a problem of the capacity of the tax system system to manage. Okay. Um, because it was alleged that it was changed sometime after 1992 okay. because of the inability of the, the, the revenue department to manage mm -hmm. and, and to police that area and suggestions that people may have abused okay. it. Mm -hmm. Now, my dear fellow Guyanese, I will ask Mr. Lal <laughs> a question that I know you know, is on your minds. Ghana's expected gross domestic product, GDP, anticipated by the end of 2023, is 14.7 billion US dollars. Per capita, our GDP is projected to be 21,859 US dollars. I'll pause because right alongside those numbers, you can look and find a report that says more than 50% of Guyanese living in Guyana live on less than five United States dollars per day, five or less, which means 1,000 Guyana dollars or less per day. In in terms of what Guyanese live on per day, Mr. Lal, what do these numbers mean? Expected GDP by the end of 2023, 14.7 billion, and per capita projected GDP at 21,859. What do these numbers mean to the ordinary guy? They don't mean nothing, sir. They do not mean anything. The World Bank has just the 48% before the official for couple of that the World Bank last reported, 48% of our people at $5.50. Is it 48 or 53? I think it was 48. Okay. But anyhow, the UNICEF said it was 43, but you know, we're talking 21, 22, mm. and so on and so forth. But we are in that 40 to 50 range, which is half of one over two. Yeah. One of two. In addition to that, the World Bank came out, this is adding to your numbers, mm. right? About two months ago, I think, and said, Guyana has been reclassified as a high income country. 13, the gross national income per capita per person mm. is 30, to qualify for that, mm. 13,846 US dollars. So what's that, two and a half million, give mm. or take? Mm. So you're telling me about per capita GDP of 21,000, uh, U.S. dollars, yeah. four million, four, four four million, million Guyana yeah. dollars. I'm talking about, in addition, in conjunction with that, high income. We are high income. How do I go and tell the guy in Albaistong or in uh, Madia, hey, you know what? You're a high income person. I may not come back out alive. The reality is this GDP. What GDP numbers are an average? They're an average. So when you say per capita, yes, you are, right. So it, it conceals a lot of skew. 
where I go back to uh, what's something that I founded upon from day one, we are a 1% society. Precisely, because if if more than 50% live on $5. <laughs> Do the multiplication. I mean, it's ridiculous right? what, Take your phone. What, no the calculator. what the 1% yes, looks like. Yeah. Yeah, the 1%. When you when when you when you disaggregate the numbers and and apportion them properly, mm -hmm. I mean, what? <sighs> Sorry, Look, you're gonna 50% tear at five dollars and call it what double it ten dollars a day, which we know it isn't. And then you you have the senior public servants and and technical people like doctor, the middle class. You really have got. 1% of the people who deal in my book with about 90% minimum of that GDP. Yeah, well, I think it was Jagdeo who was on record as having said sometime in the past that 5% of Guyana's population controls 95% of its wealth. And, and that's, that it fits. It fits. That I have no, I, I agree with that. One of the few things he and I will agree with. <clears throat> but what do you... What do you see? Where handouts have been given, or South Rupununi, anywhere in the Rupununi, handouts have been given, assurances have been offered. The look, man, you know, you don't gotta walk, money on roll. So, persons have withdrawn from cultivating mm -hmm. cassava, mm -hmm. and now there is a, an emerging food crisis in the Rupununi, mm -hmm. where farine now costs in excess of $35,000 per bag, where farine is not available, and that's a staple, like us who live on the coast, rice mm -hmm. is a staple of choice. In the Rupununi, farine, a cassava-based product cassava, right. is the staple of choice, not within recency, but for generations. Mm -hmm. What do you say to such citizens of this country who are struggling to put basic staple on the table? Oh, we sold you forest carbon credits, and here is some money, set up a special um, finance committee to manage it we will handpick the people and we will handpick the beneficiaries i mean how do you how what engages the mind of a leader at night to wake up in the morning and go out and tell people to do these things when there's a food crisis when people are hungry and you're bragging about all these billions of dollars <laughs> What do you tell the people of the Rupununi, for example? Let's move from the coast for a bit. Well, I want to tell you two things. First of all, that what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that a dependency condition is created, is fostered here. Yes, it is. It, it is fostered, and then they they are beholden to you. So there's a there's a thinking behind yes. that. But I want to take it from the from before you get to there, Marvin. And I want to make it panoramic in terms that you ask me to be the national leader. And I'm at night and I'm thinking, we got too many people crying out in this country and it's genuine. It's not fake. And we've got in, across the, in the Rupununi and in those areas. And here's what's going to happen. I am going to have to put up what, what you, whatever you want to call it, a task force, a special team and sit here. I don't want to hear the media talking about again about we've got people all over this place here in this richest country in the world with this biggest gdp i don't want to hear about people talking about hungry people and people who don't have and people who are struggling to make ends meet so here's this you've got one month the cup this should have been happening since 2021 right yeah. I, therefore you have got this amount of time to come up with a plan and we're going to sit down and tear it apart and say how we can come up with a program that helps our people 
make, make themselves sufficient whilst at the same time carrying them along. But if you put money in their hand and tell them to throw back, throw back, we can come here next month or whenever, then you're going to get what you have there. I think that that entire situation is created so you've got a reserve force there of what? De dependent people or voters yeah. or, of voters of whatever that is. <laughs> But I think, again, you've got to go to the national, the, the whole, we've got to come up with a plan. We don't want a man coming with a bag of uh, $25,000 in the envelopes and they're dropping around and say, we come in by U Street and, you know, we can be in, in Boulder and, and whatever. We've got to get something that is comprehensive and structured. These are the numbers. This is what the government can afford because, and it's budgeted for, or this is what we're going to take out of the oil money specifically to address cost of living, relief, to use a big word, amelioration, right? So we haven't had that. We have had money for infrastructure, money for infrastructure, and more money for infrastructure. You'd, so we've got all these other people here are sitting down and say, oh, what happened to we? What happened to we? In the Rupununi, you have those people. In the coastal areas, you have these people. And people are struggling. Marvin, people don't know this, and I don't like to talk to it. Go and do hospice visits. I don't know them as much since COVID. And people can't buy a couple of blood pressure tablet. You got to push on your... So I'm asking you, know, how much for a blood pressure tablet? $10. $10, you can't buy three. But that's the reality. It is. So, I mean, if that's just one stark example. So you go now and people can't plant or they stop planting cassava or they can't, they don't have money to buy farina, you know, cassava based flour. And you go in town and they can't buy fry oil. Uh, who, we, who are we then? This is. <clears throat> what are we doing as national leaders? How do I face the people? How do I face the people across the board? Not just my people, not just this region, not just that constituency. How do I face the people when I know this is not pre-oil? Marvin, this is not pre-oil. We're in the middle of the oil. Right? So any national leader now will tell you, well, we got to stagger the thing and we have to input. No, 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 no. No, that ain't holding no water. You got to come up with a plan that said these are the numbers. And this, this is needs based, this is in whatever, however the, the formula is. But we are looking specifically at what addresses the needs of our people across the board. But here's what's also troubling. In indigenous and hinterland communities, there was such a program mm -hmm. where there were village, um, village improvement projects that were proposed by villages they were evaluated, technical support was offered um, to bring proposals to, you know, where they needed to be. And those were placed not in handbags and distributed, but in the national budget yeah. Yeah. and appropriated for that purpose. Yeah. This is between 2015 and 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and the person saw dignity mm -hmm. in planning collectively, communally planning and executing plans mm -hmm. with the support of, of government and so on. People were proud to be associated with communal works, cleaning villages, um, building the Benab, you know, ensuring that the facilities and assets of the, of, the, of the village were protected and so on. But here, and that's culturally entrenched in indigenous communities. But here comes a government that says 25,000, 20,000. And there is there is inequality that's nurtured. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I might sound like I'm rambling here, but to give perspective to what I'm saying, if you go to Sacred Heart in the Aruka River, they will tell you that when those grants went there, one household got more than half a million dollars in grants, another one over $300,000 in grants, and some got absolutely none. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So apart from the mismanagement, apart from creating that dependency, disrespecting people's um, 
dignity, removing the prey. Um, you have the establishment of inequalities. Mm -hmm. All these things seem to contribute to increased poverty. It seems to be contributing to preventing the resources from getting to the, to the citizens who, who are most in need and most vulnerable. You're looking for short-term fixes. You're looking for pastors. You're looking for, you're having a welfare situation. And let me say this to you. When I, when I lived in the United States, I have seen some of the benefits, seen it firsthand from people, some of the benefits of what the welfare system did. And I've seen some of the horrors that it has introduced. So you incentivize people. You give them relief, you get them off the ground. I don't believe in this thing, but put him on in people's hand, right? Opportunities to earn. Opportunities to earn yeah. your self-respect, yes. your dignity. We've got them again and again. We've got, you said budgeted program. Yep. From a budget come a program comes accountability. We haven't Precisely. used that word. Let's go back to the $24 million man. Yeah. Count you got to come back and tell me how you spend this money, Bano. Yeah. And you got to give me in people. You think I then you head. Right. All right? And then they tear up the and it gone up the chain and somebody cover for you and all that. No, 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 no. It comes down this way, the money cascades down this way, and you've got to report on it along the line. Because we gotta report on it. Right? We've well, got too much money around here for, for us to be talking about poverty. We we Viewers, you children the nation watch. We're winding down. We're running out of time. I'm speaking with Mr. GHK Lal. Of course, I'm your host, Marvin Williams. We're running out of time here, but quickly, Mr. Lal. If we're at if we are at 874 billion Ghana dollars, which is somewhere in the region of 4.37 billion US dollars, and we're talking about 42% getting lost. <laughs> to use my my term, that's for we're talking about three hundred sixty-seven billion Ghana dollars or one point eight billion U.S. dollars. Is this not possibly the major contributor to the money not getting to the beneficiaries, Ghana citizens? That is. You're looking for me to answer that. Of course you are. <laughs> How can it be a minor contributor, Marvin? You're talking, and let me you go back. Three hundred and sixty-seven. Correct me. Yeah. Billion Ghana dollars. Mm. 42 percent lost <laughs> hijacked misplaced fell through the cracks fell through the cracks mislabeled we'll find it some other time here's this take half of the money what 42 percent take 20 take 20 percent you're still talking our our 80 million dollars there a billion dollars mm -hmm. 180 billion dollars not reaching the people that's your relief story that's that's the title you got on there. Yeah, but you see, the interesting thing about the PVP, they talk about development, mm -hmm. growth. Yes. Well, there's growth in that number because in during the life of the ninth parliament, mm -hmm. that 2006, 2011, Professor Clive Thomas did a study mm -hmm. and offered the opinion based on the studies that there was a shrinkage of 20%. You got the shrinkage now. All right, go on. No, I'm using his term. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Go ahead. But no, we have more than double that. Yeah. Well, inflation, right? I mean, and we got oil money. Sliding on the oil. Yeah. But quickly, I think we got what? Um, like five minutes remaining? Yes, sir. Chinese landing. I'm sure you've, you, you yeah. it's been in the news. So the contention was that human rights violations, um, mining by private individuals or private company within um, titled Amerindian village of Chinese landing, um, contrary to the free prior and informed consent of the village and so on. So the, um, I think it was the Human Rights Commission of the UN, I think it might have been. I-C-A-H-R. <laughs> that had written to the president based on a complaint. And so the real president stepped out recently and said, mm -hmm. look, the solution to Chinese landing is stop all mining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, pretty much like if 
friends and preferred um, beneficiaries of the People's Progressive Party can benefit, then nobody must, including the people who own the land and, 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 and the resources. Mm -hmm. This, again, you're talking about messing with people's um, economic life. Yeah. Um, you're talking about depriving them of being beneficiaries of what they own. You are you are really really creating the ideal situation for poverty to thrive. Comment on that, please, if you will, sir. Well, I I go back to the beginning when you talked. I I got to go back to that twenty four million dollar guy. Yeah. Everything stops here. Yeah. I say it stop here, so it it stops. So <laughs> the the real president says, well, no more mining bodies. If you know this is the problem, no more mining. So I'm looking, at, certainly it creates poverty. So it creates a dependency also. You got to come back and beg you. Oh, give me an ease, let go, let go a little bit. Even if you got to bring back the mine. If you got to bring back the mine. <laughs> so the, 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 there's a thinking here that, the, the first of all, we can put a squeeze for you. I'm going to put a lash for you. We're going to make you hollow, right? We're going to make, we're going to lay in our real uh, squeezes and show you who's boss. Come back again to the beginning of the program. Mm -hmm. And... When you come to, you know, uh, look, we come to this point now that we got to come hands on knees, which is classic PPP operate, uh, MO, right? You come to the art, we're going to see what we can do, and we're going to string you along. Back to the matter, you're going to create economic deprivation, you're going to create personal hardships, you're going to create, you, you are in, look, we've got about so many things wrong in this place here, and we really ought not. I think there is some sort of solution here, and I don't think that this, 100% closure is the answer. It can't be. It, it must revolve around the rights of the people, people right. and the rights of the people to sure. enjoy the, the, the um, unhindered access mm -hmm. and benefits from the resources that they own. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Gabriel Lal, Mr. GHK Lal, for joining me on Nation Watch today. I really do appreciate your. Um, presence here and your contribution to this conversation. I'm sure Guyanese citizens at home and abroad are better positioned to relate to some of the issues that we've discussed. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me and it was my pleasure sharing with you, my fellow Guyanese. Thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it for Nation Watch for the day 10th September 2023. I am Marvin Williams, your host. We have been discussing pervasive poverty in oil-rich Guyana with Mr. GHKLL. Thank you very much for joining us and staying with us to the end. Until we meet again, God bless. As Guyana sits on the economic and political crossroads, we speak to the nation's opinion leaders and decision makers to get their views on the challenges the country faces and the path it must take to achieve national development. Welcome to Nation Watch. Now here is your host Mervyn Williams, former member of the Guyana Parliament.